So you got your first peptides, and now you're staring at this vial of powder, wondering what the hell you're supposed to do with it. How do you mix it? How do you store it? How long does it last once you add this water? You start searching online and you find a dozen different answers that all contradict each other. Honestly, most people are kind of flying blind when it comes to this stuff because there's not a lot of clear information out there that actually explains why these rules exist. So in this video, I'm gonna walk you through everything you need to know about handling and storing your peptides from start to finish. But before we get started, I just want to give you a quick reminder that this is not medical advice. And before you put anything into your body, always consult with a licensed physician. Okay. So before we get into the details here, I want to explain a key concept that's going to make everything else make sense. And that term is lyophilization. Now, lyophilization is really just a fancy word for freeze drying. And here's how it works. Your peptide starts as a liquid solution, but in order to make it stable for storage and shipping, they freeze it solid. Then they put it under very low pressure. And under that low pressure, something interesting happens. The frozen water doesn't melt back into liquid. It actually skips the liquid phase entirely and goes directly from solid ice to gas. And this process is called sublimation. What you're left with after all of that is that dry, stable, crystalline white powder that you see when you look inside your vial. There's no water in there anymore. It's been completely removed. Without water present, peptide molecules are essentially frozen in place. They can't move around. They can't react with anything and they can't break down. And this is exactly why properly stored lyophilized peptides can remain stable for two to three years in the right conditions. Now, when your peptide is in that lyophilized powder form, you're playing by one set of rules. But the moment you add water to it, you're now playing by a completely different set of rules. And understanding that distinction is going to give you a lot of clarity on how to handle this stuff correctly. So let's start with the powder. Before you ever add water, here's what you need to know. For long-term storage, your freezer is the ideal place. At around zero degrees Fahrenheit, lyophilized peptides can remain stable for up to two to three years without any significant degradation. Your refrigerator, which sits around 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit, works perfectly fine if you're planning to use it within three to six months. And even room temperature is acceptable for two to four weeks which is exactly why peptides can ship at room temperature without getting destroyed in transit. Now, the thing that will actually damage your powder is moisture. And this is where people make a really common mistake without even realizing they're doing it. So picture this, you pull a vial out of the refrigerator and you immediately pop the cap off because you're ready to mix it up. But here's what's happening that you can't see. That vial is cold, the air in your room is warm and warm air holds moisture. So when that warm, humid air hits the cold surface of your vial, you get condensation. Those tiny water droplets form right on your peptide powder. And now you've just introduced moisture to a compound that was specifically designed to be kept away from moisture. And that can actually damage your peptide before you ever get a chance to use it. So here's what you need to do instead. When you take a vial out of cold storage, just let it sit at room temperature for about 15 to 30 minutes before you open it. Let it warm up. Let it reach the same temperature as the air around it. And then you can safely open it without any condensation forming on the powder inside. So now your powder is at room temperature and you're ready to reconstitute. And this is where everything changes. Your lyophilized peptide was stable for two to three years in the freezer. But the moment you add water, you're now working within a window of days to weeks, depending upon which peptide you're using. And the reason is very simple. Water is what your peptide needs to become biologically active. You can't inject powder. You need it in liquid form. But water is also what enables your peptide to break down over time through chemical reactions that happen at the molecular level. So when you add that bacteriostatic water to your vial, you need to understand that two separate clocks just started ticking. 
And most people have no idea that these clocks are actually measuring completely different things. The first clock is measuring microbial safety. The moment you push a needle through that rubber stopper, you've created a pathway for bacteria to potentially get inside. Every single time you draw from that vial, there's an opportunity for contamination to it. And this is exactly why you use bacteriostatic water. The bacteriostatic water contains 0.9% benzyl alcohol, and that benzyl alcohol inhibits bacterial growth. It doesn't kill bacteria outright, but it stops them from multiplying. So even if a small amount of bacteria gets introduced, it can't take over the vial. And this is where that 28 day rule comes from. There's a pharmaceutical compounding standard called USP 797. And it says that multi-dose vials reconstituted with bacteriostatic water should be used within 28 days when stored in the refrigerator at 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a microbial safety standard. It's about making sure you don't inject yourself with a contaminated solution. So that's clock one, microbial safety. 28 days maximum with bacteriostatic water when refrigerated. But here's what most people completely miss. There's a second clock running at the exact same time and it's measuring something totally different. The second clock is measuring chemical stability. And this is tracking how fast your peptide is actually breaking down at the molecular level. And this clock runs at completely different speeds depending upon which peptide you're using. So let me give you some specific examples. Semaglutide is extremely stable. FDA data shows it remains effective for 56 days refrigerated after reconstitution. So with semaglutide, your chemical stability clock actually runs slower than your microbial safety clock, which means the 28 day rule is your limiting factor. CJC1295 and ipamorelin sit in the middle of that spectrum. Most sources put those around four to six weeks refrigerated. So with these peptides, your two clocks are running at roughly the same pace, which means you wanna use them within that window to stay safe on both fronts. And then you have something like IGF-1 LR3, which is so unstable that it degrades within days, not weeks. With IGF-1, that chemical clock is running so fast that the 28-day microbial rule is basically irrelevant because your peptide will have already broken down long before you hit that window. So now you can see the problem with blindly following the 28 day rule for everything. That rule is about bacterial safety. It's clock one, but some peptides chemically degrade in a matter of days. And some peptides are chemically stable for almost two months. Understanding this distinction is how you move from blindly following rules you read on the internet to actually understanding what's happening inside of that vial. So now that you understand the two clocks, let's talk about what actually speeds up that chemical degradation clock. The big one is heat. Every chemical reaction speeds up when you increase the temperature. And the general rule with peptides is that the rate of degradation roughly doubles for every 18 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. So a peptide sitting on your bathroom counter at 72 degrees is breaking down about four times faster than the same peptide sitting in your refrigerator at 40 degrees. Now, does that mean leaving your vial out for 20 minutes while you do your injection is gonna cause problems? No, that's totally fine. But leaving it on your counter for an entire day or forgetting it out overnight is going to noticeably accelerate how quickly your peptide degrades. So the simple rule here is to just refrigerate your reconstituted peptides and don't leave them sitting out any longer than you actually need to. Here's the one that surprises a lot of people. Freezing a reconstituted peptide will destroy it. And most people assume that if cold is good, then colder means better. But that's not how this works. Freezing your reconstituted peptide is not the same thing as lyophilization. When you just throw something in your home freezer, the water freezes it in an uncontrolled way. Ice crystals form, those crystals physically damage the peptide structure. On top of that, as the ice forms, the peptides get concentrated in whatever liquid remains. And that high concentration triggers something called aggregation, where the peptides start clumping together. A single freeze-thaw cycle can completely destroy a reconstituted peptide. So this is a hard rule with no exceptions. Never put your reconstituted vials in the freezer. Refrigerator only, at 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. 
All right, so now let's talk about actually mixing your peptide. First things first, make sure your vial has been sitting at room temperature for about 15 to 30 minutes like we talked about earlier. You don't want that condensation forming when you open it up. Then take an alcohol swab and clean the rubber stopper. Let it dry completely before you go any further. When you inject the bacteriostatic water into the vial, you want to direct the water down the inside wall of the vial rather than spraying it directly into the powder. You're letting it run down the glass and make contact with the powder gently from the side. And the reason that matters is because when you spray liquid directly onto powder, it creates bubbles and foam. Research has shown that proteins and peptides can actually denature at air-liquid interfaces, which is basically the surface of those bubbles. The peptide molecules unfold at those interfaces and they don't fold back correctly. Now, if you accidentally spray the powder directly, your peptide is probably still usable, but running the water down the wall is better technique because it minimizes foam formation. So that's what you should aim for going forward. And for the same reason, you don't want to shake your vial because shaking creates foam and causes the same problem. If you need to help the powder dissolve, you gently roll the vial between your palms or give it a slow swirl. The solution should become completely clear and colorless within a few minutes. Once it's fully dissolved, grab a marker and label your vial with the date you mixed it, the name of the peptide, and the concentration you mix the dot. And if you don't know this, I actually have a free tracker app that you can download for your phone where you put all the information for the supplements you're taking. It'll give you reminders, exactly what you should be doing with it, and it's all tracked for you with reminders to tell you exactly when you should be doing your dosages. Check the description of this video below and you can download it for free. Because the last thing you wanna do is forget this information. And if you don't write it down, or use my free app, you might run into some problems later. Then once you're done, make sure you get it into the refrigerator right away. So before each injection, you should get in the habit of actually looking at your solution. A properly reconstituted peptide should be completely clear with no visible particles floating around and no cloudiness or haziness to it. If you see cloudiness, that's a sign of aggregation which means the peptide molecules are clumping together. If you see actual particles floating around in there, that's more advanced aggregation. And if you see any color changes or the solution is turned into a gel, that's severe degradation. Any of those signs mean you should discard that vial and mix a fresh one because it's not going to give you the results you're looking for. Here's something important to understand. A clear solution doesn't guarantee that your peptide is still fully potent because chemical degradation can happen at the molecular level without causing any visible changes whatsoever. And this is exactly why you wanna follow the recommended timeframes for each specific peptide rather than going by how the solution looks. And if you're wondering where you can find all that information, you can actually get it for free inside of my school community. I've listed it all out there for you. So once you understand the why behind all these guidelines, you're not flying blind anymore. You're not just memorizing rules. You actually understand what's happening inside of that vial, which means you can make good decisions even in situations that aren't covered by some guide you read online. Now, if you want help staying up to date, like I said, I do have that school community and we provide peptide research, safety protocols, and where people are finding safe sources. There's a link to join my free school community in the description below. Inside, I share clear breakdowns of studies, practical strategies, and resources for making all this sustainable and easy to follow for you, even if you're a beginner. And last thing, Make sure you drop your questions in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more real world insights on supplements, peptides, and proven methods to get lean and strong the right way. I really hope this video was valuable for you and I'll see you next week for another Supplement Spotlight.